Lloyd Austin said that if Ukraine falls, I really, he says that he really believes that NATO will be in a fight with Russia. And Putin today said that they are totally ready if the West wants to escalate this conflict. How do you see the situation? Are we approaching World War III? If I want to be the least bit optimistic, I say they're positioning themselves for negotiations. But that would mean I'd have to give them credit for having some brains. I don't. Uh, so it worries me. Very, very worrisome. Macron's statements... Others who've been somewhat bellicose when they have absolutely no reason to be bellicose um, worries me. And as Putin intimated, uh, even almost outright said, if NATO gets involved, who knows where this will stop? And my grave concern there is, and I keep coming back to this, and I've had a number of discussions with colleagues We'll be the ones who use nuclear weapons first. We will be the ones who will lose and we will not go down. And so we'll resort to nuclear weapons. And that holds in almost any scenario you want to develop with a peer power. If we go to war with China, we will lose in the opening 30 to 45 days. Casualties will be humongous, like we haven't seen since our Civil War. Uh, they'll even strip... They'll be more like Gettysburg, 55,000, I think, in three days. They'll be like Passchendaele, like Ypres in World War I. Um, and, you know, we'll lose two, three carriers the first week, first month. The American people will see that the United States is losing, at least at that moment in time, and we'll go nuclear. We, the United States of America, will initiate nuclear war. And you can look at the leadership right now in the Pentagon, at the State Department, and in the White House and tell me I'm wrong. Macron said that he's willing to send troops to Ukraine to fight Russia. And 68% of people in France are against this decision of Macron. Putin today said there is no reason for Russia to attack Europe. Why we should attack Europe? What's in it for us? Absolutely nothing. As I just described, he can make that scenario climb too. He knows exactly where it will lead to. Um, Macron, uh, Macron's force de frappe, now force de suasion, dissuasion, would be lost in Putin's first salvo. I mean, come on, guys. If you put all the nuclear weapons in the NATO countries other than the United States together, you wouldn't have enough to even start the kind of thing that Putin could start. I mean, we're talking about between us and Putin, some 10 to 12,000 nuclear warriors. Um, that's enough to destroy the world several times over. Uh, I don't know what these other penny ante people are doing. London bothers me. Paris now bothers me. Germany bothers me for other reasons. Um, things are not, as I said, I think NATO is going to fall apart and it's going to fall apart so quickly and so dramatically and so disastrously that it's going to shock everybody in the West. Do you see some sort of sanity on the part of the Biden administration? Because they are in charge of managing all these things. You look at Antony Blinken in his recent meeting with Lula da Silva, the president of Brazil, he says he sees no conditions for peace talks in Ukraine. Zelensky, in his latest interview with Fox News, he says Ukraine doesn't have plan B, doesn't have a backup plan. It seems that nobody's forcing him to change his attitude toward this conflict. Well, Blinken's remarks reveal if he's telling the truth, and I almost believe he is, that he is dumber than even I thought he was. Um, but your question is a good question. And it's one that my colleagues and I, I just finished an exchange with the Army General. Um, we, we can't figure out Austin. First of all, we think he's incompetent. Just the business with his operation and not telling the chain of command where he was. And uh, he's incompetent. He's utterly incompetent. I don't care how much Biden respects and loves him. He's utterly incompetent. And we pretty much agree about the leadership of the military and all services at the top right now, with very little exception. And we've had some really serious discussions about how we got to this point. Discussions that took me back to my days with Powell when he was chairman and Senator Chuck Hagel called him and said, Mr. Chairman, I'm looking at the three and four star lists here in front of me right now, which is a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee he had to sign off on. 
that's the way we do things when we promote to that higher rank. Congress has to affirm the, the, the promotions. He said, I do not see a single person on this list, not a single one, Colin, whom I would make a service chief, a chairman, a vice chairman, or for that matter, give three or four stars to, period. What's wrong, Colin? Well, we're living with that now. We have total incompetence at the top of the most supposedly powerful military in the world. It isn't. It's not powerful. It's hollow as hell right now, with the exception of nuclear weapons. But we, my colleagues and I, when we discuss this, we just, we throw our hands up in the air. We, we can't understand this. Jockeying for negotiating position and making strident statements to try and force the other side to be more accommodating when you go to the table, that's one thing. If that's what they're doing, I take everything back. I don't think that's what they're doing. I think they're stating their true visions, their true beliefs, and their true direction in terms of strategy. And it's preposterous. It's absurd. It is insane. Larry, the other thing that Zelensky said in this interview with Fox News, he said that nobody... I I, sorry, I didn't comment on Zelensky's comment. I, yeah. That just proves to me that he hadn't got a brain in his, le his head left either. This has all wiped out his cerebral powers. Who's going to force him to have a plan B? Is it going to be yeah. Russia or the United States or Washington? You know, if I were Putin right now, just to just to reinforce my position and the position I think that in the Tucker Carlson interview he more or less revealed and has revealed at times before that, particularly through his foreign minister, Sergey Lavrov, if I were Putin, I would stop right now. I would build some formidable defenses and I would say, OK, here I am. Um, I've got what I want. I'll just sit here and wait. I'll wait till hell freezes over. We'll elect a new president if I die, and he'll wait till hell freezes over until you stupid bastards are ready to negotiate. You think I want some more of NATO? What the hell would I want any more of NATO for? One of the things that he said in this interview with Fox News is that nobody needs Abdivka. If nobody needs Abdivka, why they have been sacrificing too much in this conflict? You could ask that question about, the, the, about three quarters of the battles and the war itself. Um, if if you've got what you want, stop. If you've got what you want and you don't want anything else because of the reasons you've stated, you don't want to run a, a, a whole Ukraine. I mean, you would have guerrillas all over the place all the time. You'd have Azov-type guys running around trying to do you damage all the time. Be, be like Chechnya all over again, except when you did what you did in Chechnya and Ukraine, it'd be a lot tougher and you'd be right next door to people who'd be watching you do it. And, and you probably can't do that kind of thing uh, that close to the European borders that count. Um, so I don't understand this at all. I see so many nuts, so many insane people running around that it reminds me of 1914. It reminds me of 1914 and the automaticity of idiocy, the automaticity of insanity mobilization tables, trains running, German generals implementing their plans because if they wait one more day, they won't be able to, you know, all this crap. That's what I see, only I see imponderable insanity here. I can go back and look at Ludendorff and look at Tirpitz and look at some of the other things involved in World War One, and I can at least, as Barbara Tuckman has done quite well, I think, show that they were wooden-headed, but but that wooden-headedness was moving them down with an automaticity down towards the worst war in human history to that point. This is insanity doing it, and it's just hard to think about. It's hard to describe, and especially when a uh, high school class I was talking to this morning, I said, I recommend none of you go into the military. You're listening to a 31-year veteran of the United States Army. I recommend none of you 18 and 19 year olds go into the United States military because all your military is doing today is being led by people who are insane, infested with lust for money, want to get out of the military and make seven, eight figures with the defense contractors, want war after war after war. You would be insane, young lady, young man, if you went into the United States Armed Forces. I never thought. I'm almost 80 years old. I never thought I would be saying that to young kids. 
Associated Press wrote an article in which it says the U.S. military is preparing for new wars. Do you think that they're thinking of fighting with China as well? Because these new wars, where are these new wars? Well, Secretary Gates, uh, now my uh, uh, chancellor down at William & Mary, is wont to say, and I think he stole this from Colin because I heard Colin say it a lot of times, but Colin probably stole, stole it from Ronald Reagan, the next war you're going to have is the war you didn't expect. And right now, there are all kinds of things percolating in the Eastern Mediterranean in particular. Have you seen what Erdogan has done recently? You know, I said Erdogan would be a uniter of the Islamic world if he just marched down that thin strip of land, Lebanon, Syria, and just wiped out the IDF. And he could do that. He's got the military to do that. But that would mean he would have to play Caesar Augustus or Attila the Hun at the worst, um, Charlemagne, someone who is motivated to use military power to establish a fiefdom, an empire in his case, to bring Islam together and, and make it whole again. I think he's smarter than that now. I'm watching what he's doing. He just made two deals with El Sisi. And I don't have the details on them yet, but I have the rough sketch. He more or less bought the port of Alexandria. It's sort of like the Chinese did with Sri Lanka, that 99-year lease, I think. But he probably put billions, promised billions, in LTC's hands. Not only that, he has procured from Egypt land down at the southern tip of the Sinai. If, if, you, if you're familiar with the geography, you know the little arm goes off the Red Sea into the Gulf of Aqaba, and then the little arm goes off into the Suez, Gulf of Suez and the Suez Canal. Well, right there at the tip of that Gulf of Aquaba is Isla, the Israeli complex. And above that is Obda, one of their most formidable Air Force bases. As I understand, the second deal he pulled off with El Sisi, he's uh, rented <laughs> for however period the land next to that, right there at the end of the Sinai. Then I find out this morning he's finally got what he's been trying to get for almost two years. Uh, back up a little bit. You know, Djibouti is about to sink with all the militaries on it. Japan, China, the French, the British, the U.S., all there. Erdogan wanted to get into Djibouti, but he couldn't because there's not any space left. You know, the guy who runs Djibouti would love to let him because he just plays all these people off against one another, getting a higher rent every year. But what he's done is made a deal. He went to Sudan, he went to Eritrea, Ethiopia, couldn't get a deal. Now he's made a deal, apparently, with Somalia. It includes helping the Somal uh, Somalis deal with their problems, which we have not been able to deal with in Mogadishu and elsewhere. Um, but it also includes frontage on the Red Sea, the new strategic competition cockpit. That's where it is. The Houthis are proving that every day now. Um, so Erdogan is smart. He's encircling this area. Um, I don't know what that's going to mean when other people figure it out. You know, he did this with Qatar. Remember when Mohammed bin Salman put a boycott on Qatar and everybody thought, well, they're, they're falling out again. The Gulf Cooperation Council never has been worth anything. They're falling. And all of a sudden, Turkey wound up putting troops in Qatar and saying to Mohammed bin Salman under the covers, um, you aren't going to bother my buddies in Qatar. And, and finally, he lifted the boycott. Well, this is Erdogan tentatively looking for what I think he's been looking for all along, this recognition as the sole leader and unifier of the Muslim world. And maybe he's smarter than I thought even. He's going to do it very carefully, slowly, methodically, and he's going to do it with trade, economics, money, and geopositioning rather than actually marching armies. Um, we need to watch him. And I, I don't mean that in the sense that he's an enemy, but I do mean that he's smarter than us. Us being Washington. And London. And Paris. You rebuffed me, EU. You rebuffed me for years. You kept me on the stick for years. I am now going to rebuff you. <laughs> CIA Director William Burns just recently was in Kiev. How do you evaluate this trip? What was the reason behind this? Why he had to go there personally? 
You know, I don't know why the director of the CIA is so involved, other than to say that, as I've said in the past, uh, when I knew Bill, he was one of the better diplomats at the State Department. Um, and when he was our ambassador to Moscow, I think he proved himself to be, and the ambassadorial corps attests that to me, a very a very fine diplomat. And I think he's the only one in the administration. He's a single diplomat in the administration. So um, he's made some rather inane remarks in support of his president, in support of Ukraine. But you know, as Ray McGovern and I pointed out the other day in an op-ed we wrote that was published only in Consortium News, Washington Post. New York Times, no other mainline, no Wall Street Journal, nobody else would publish it because it told the truth. It quoted Biden. It quoted Blinken. It quoted all the people like Burns and like Obama who have said to do what we're doing in Ukraine would be insanity. They said it much earlier. Blinken was, I think, national security advisor for Vice President Joseph Biden at the time he said it. Now look at what they're saying. It makes no sense other than that they all are hallucinating or they're so wrapped up in the idea that, and when I used to teach this case to my students, they would look at me like, uh, it, this can't be the real reason, like LBJ was with respect to Vietnam. If I cut and run from Vietnam, no matter how much I think I should, no matter how much you, George Ball, you have told me and convinced me that I should not go any further in Vietnam. I should get out. I am not going to be seen as cutting and running from a war zone by the American people. Therefore, I'm staying in, and some 30,000 more Americans were killed, and God knows how many Vietnamese. I, that's all I can explain. The, the domestic politics has made these people insane. The Ukrainian intelligence reported that there are some attempts to overthrow Zelensky by spring. Do you think that the situation in Ukraine is getting out of the hand of Washington? That's why William Burns was there. Yeah, apparently oh. that was that must have been Newland's mission too, at least a part of it, and she failed um, as she was wont to do. Um, and and Bill followed up with some real diplomatic prowess. Um, that would be very typical for Ukraine. I mean, that that's what Ukraine's been doing for the past 12, 15, 20 years. When I first got into the State Department and had to deal with Yanukovych, <laughs> it was like, okay, who's leading it today? <laughs> Is it Timoshenko? Is it? Um, so maybe you're right. And I, I, I just, I can't believe that we would be trying to hold together a regime that's losing a conflict that we're backing in that lost conflict that is no way possible to get out of that conflict without a loss, that the loss is deepening every day, that the potential for it to be quite catastrophic is changing every day, getting worse, and that we would be doing anything other than advising that person to follow us to the negotiating table. I, I can't, I just, it's hard for me to answer your question. When you look at this type of behavior on the part of Macron, since this conflict started, he was willing to make some sort of negotiations between the West and Russia. And he came out out of, out of nowhere talking about let's fight Russia in Ukraine. And the other leaders who were more radical than him, they said, no, that's not our policy. This is what I meant when earlier, six or seven months ago, I told you about the dissolution of NATO, which I think is inevitable. They can't keep their pants on together. They simply can't. And it was difficult enough with the original ones that Atchison and Truman more or less fashioned into a group that they could get. Woo, it was really close. The United States Congress almost didn't approve it. Had it not been for Korea, had it not been for the war in Korea, the North Koreans did us a big favor. Stalin did us a big favor. And Dean Atchison, were he here today, he would tell you that. Because the money that then was cut loose, didn't go to Korea. A penance of it went to Korea. That war was fought on a dime and a string. Went to Europe. It made the Congress finally find the majority in both houses to approve NATO and approve the money that Atchison and Truman wanted for it. So it's always been a close-run thing. But that was the original countries. I forget how many it was, seven or eight or something like that. We got 31 now. That's untenable, absolutely untenable. You cannot possibly keep 31 countries in Concord. Look at what happened in the Balkans. Wes Clark, the general at that time, 
Wes Clark was the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe and the Commander of the United States Forces in Europe. Two hats. He had to go out of his U.S. hat, put on his Supreme Allied Commander hat, go to Tony Blair, who he knew was sympathetic, and ask Blair to go to Clinton to threaten ground forces before Milosevic. 78 days we've been bombing them, and there was no sign they were going to move. So Blair says, okay, I'll do it, and Clinton finds out about it, of course, and releases Wes Clark early, fires him in essence. But that's the only reason we got that resolved was because one of the leaders saw the truth of what the military commander was saying and let him do it. And, and then back brief Clinton on it. Clinton was furious. Um, and so was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in America because Clark had gone outside his hat. Perfectly legal. He was in his other hat to do it, but we didn't like it, as we often don't. But that's what you do when you deal with allies. You and, and to get 31 of them? Come on. Ukrainians are asking desperately are asking for F-16 fighters. They believe that it's going to be a game changer in Ukraine. Do you think at the end of the day, Washington would send F-16s to Ukraine? They might, but I will tell you, it won't be a game changer, no more so than the Abrams tanks were. Um, it will not be a game changer. Uh, it might make the situation momentarily a little bit better. It might contest Soviet air supremacy. It might be a contest for a week or two, but unless U.S. or other highly qualified F-16 pilots were flying those airplanes, I understand the Norwegians are pretty good in them too. They led the Libya strikes, for example, uh, which just to me, that's unconscionable that we would be proud or Norway would be proud of its young aviators leading Libya, the bombing in Libya. Um, one of the worst things we've done in a long time was Libya. Look, look at the basket case it is today and, and just say, OK, Iraq, we made Iraq a back basket case. Afghanistan, we made Iraq a basket case. Syria, we made a basket case. Oh, let's throw Libya in for good luck. But the Norwegians led that, led the bombing strikes. Um, I would not be proud of that at all. I would be ashamed of it. Uh, and unless you've got those kind of pilots, really qualified, talented pilots, the F-16 is, the hardware is not going to make much difference. Ukrainians have a lot of problems at the border with Poland, and the farmers are not happy in Poland. And here comes the importance of Edessa again and again for Ukraine. Yes. Look at the latest, the, the people over there in Moldova and <laughs> Transnistria, <laughs> come please. <laughs> I mean, and, no and all of a sudden you've got a, <laughs> you got you're half surrounded in the south. And you see nobody caring about that. They are at war right now. They are fighting Russia right now. And they are having, at the same time, having these problems at the border with Poland. When this war ends, how are they going to manage this? It's a good question. And let me just say that I would dare say that there's not a map in Joe Biden's or Tony Blinken's office. I don't mean that there's not a map there. I just mean that they are not geographically inclined. They don't think in terms of maps, oceans, rivers, ports, and such. Erdogan does. <laughs> I'm watching him. He is a crafty individual. He reminds me of a sort of, uh, he reminds me of Philip of Macedon, Alexander's father, who probably would have done as well or better than Alexander had he survived, um, even though he wasn't tutored by Aristotle. Um, but he remind, Erdogan reminds me of that sort of an individual. He's always thinking and he's always looking at a map. We have huge clashes in Tel Aviv against Nadia and his administration. Do you see any sort of pressure on the Nadia administration and his party to change their attitude or they're not going to change? It? I think there's tremendous pressure, but I don't think it's the right kind. There is some of the right kind, but I don't think that's the overwhelming pressure. I think the overwhelming pressure is his apparent to the Israelis, the Jewish Israelis, um, his apparent disdain for the hostages and, and not pressing, you know, the way they want every day, every minute to get the hostages back. And his explanation on Face the Nation two days ago was not a very good one. Um, I think the other side of it is the angst that was building already before October the 7th, and that's sort of mixing with that. But I think the fundamental Jewish-Israeli 
is with him in terms of what he's doing in Gaza. And that's really shameful. But I think that's the truth. But it's no more shameful than the average American being with us for killing Iraqis, for killing Afghans, for killing Syrians, for killing Libyans. I mean, the average American was out there going, yeah, hey, kill some more. Um, that said, I do think he's in trouble right now. And I think he sort of gave inklings of that trouble, although he tried not to. He tried not to show any ankle, ankle at all in that Face the Nation interview. She, she stayed on him. She stayed on him pretty good. Um, he, he's got to readjust before he can do the ground offensive in Rafa. He's got to move forces around, redeploy them within Gaza, and he's got to call up some reserves probably in order to do it. That gives him this period he needs and an excuse for the period to negotiate, quote unquote, and to move towards some sort of a temporary ceasefire, at least, and to gain the hostages back or at least a, a good portion of them back and to vet who he's going to turn loose and to get the deal going with the uh, Hamas leaders where they'll accept who he's going to turn loose. Because I don't think the Israeli populace who know these prisoners pretty well is going to be very supportive of him if he turns loose some of the most dangerous ones. And yet those are the ones Hamas is going to be asking for. So he's got a lot of problems. What I'm worried about in this interim period, this period that he's doing all this in, he's going to widen the war. He's going to look around and he's going to say, okay, maybe towards the end of the period, say it's 21 days or whatever, he says Ramadan, um, and he gets towards the end, and there's about a week left or so, and it's not working very well. And Hamas has not been very cooperative. And the United States is pounding him still, pounding him. We want a permanent ceasefire, or we want a longer ceasefire, but whatever it might be. Then he widens the war, and Hezbollah is the obvious place to go widen the war. Wouldn't be very difficult. Iran doesn't want it. Nasrallah doesn't want it. Hezbollah's rank and file doesn't want it. But they're not going to turn it down if he starts attacking them in a way that they have to respond to. And he knows that. And so that's how he could widen the war. And what would that mean? Here's my big question. What would that mean for us? Because he can't handle two fronts. He can't. It's going to, it's going to be bad. And we already, I'm told, I don't know. I've checked this this morning. I've heard it again and again, and I can't believe it. I hope it's not true. But I heard there were U.S. special forces in those tunnels with the Israeli soldiers helping them. Helping them with what is my question, because I can't imagine our special forces know more about tunnel fighting than the Israelis do. But if that's the case, then I could see some U.S. support pouring in that's more obvious. Um, if, if he starts taking it on both ends and he starts having to retreat to the center, so to speak, then there'll be all kinds of people leaving Israel. Lots have already left. But and and it, it's somewhat of a brain drain because you know the rich people are the first people who get out. <laughs> the people who have it made, they're the first people to run. Uh, so he's already got immigration taking place, but this could really force it, and people would be wanting to get out before it squeezed down to where they couldn't get out. So this would be a desperate situation for him, and I think the United States would probably wind up putting forces on the ground there. Then where do we go from there? Um, I don't think that's a recipe for anything but further escalation, further danger, and maybe even bringing in some other peer powers. Um, Putin has hinted at that sort of thing. He's hinted that he might you know, do something different with regard to the Middle East. His only real bastion still of any consequence in that region is Syria. Um, and, and so if that's threatened too, if let's say Israel decides they want to strike out that way, um, that could be a provocation to get the United States to do what Netanyahu has lusted for us to do for 15 plus years, and that's attack Iran. The United States directly attack Iran at a minimum to hit them with relentless airstrikes around the clock in their nuclear facilities. That would also take care of our problem with Iran getting closer and closer to a nuclear weapon. Um, I'm, he's, he's probably pitching that almost every week to Biden. Um, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you going after Iran? You know, the real source of all this evil is Iran. Um, there's all kinds of, this whole situation is pregnant with adverse possibilities. 
especially for us, because we're so stuck with our nose up Israel's rear end. Do they know what would be the end game for them? He said very explicitly what he wants to do. And the first thing he wants to do is impossible, and that's destroy Hamas. Uh, when you say destroy Hamas, and, and when he elucidates, it means no more Hamas, period. Well, you aren't going to accomplish that mission. So what's your next one? Well, we're going to make sure that what is left of Gaza is not ruled by anybody we don't like, which means we're going to rule it. Did you see the incident that happened just a few hours ago when the uh, Israeli Defense Forces apparently... Uh, I'm not quite sure on the intelligence yet, but they apparently started shooting at the people who were trying to get food. They're starving to death. They're trying to get food. They started shooting at them. Then what happened is I'm told two people on the ground there, one uh, uh, aid worker and, and one observer, said that they actually got into battles with the protesters. And I said, the protesters, you mean the hostage, um, the people who are protesting over the hostages not being released? Well, no, no, no. The protesters who are settlers who are protesting that they aren't being tough enough on the Palestinians, getting them out of the way fast enough so they can start breaking ground for their settlements. Aha. Okay, that's what I said was going to happen. Ben Gavir is standing at the border, waiting to cross into Gaza, where all that rubble exists now, and where all those homes have been destroyed, apartments, hotels, hospitals, and everything else, clear the rubble and start building settlements. That's what they're there for. So that compounded that misery there as people were shooting from every direction and killing some 200 people, I'm told, were killed and a bunch of others wounded. So uh, th this is what his plan is. This is his second objective, that no one's going to have Gaza but him. And ultimately, that means the settlers. He's going to do precisely in Gaza what he did in the West Bank and is doing in East Jerusalem. He's going to cleanse the areas of any Palestinian orchards, farms, buildings, whatever, build highways and build settlements. That's what he's going to do. They start very rough. And then they, after five or six years, they kind of look like Hollywood Hills. Um, go over there and look. And the and the roads that go through them are designed not only for easy access for settlers, but to keep Palestinians from being able to congregate, get together and whatever. And besides, there won't be any Palestinians left. And in Gaza, in the north part of Gaza, there's going to be nobody because he's going to hold them off and Ben Gavir is going to be building his summons. Um, Biden and Blinken think they're going to get, and Mohammed bin Salman think they're going to get some kind of agreement from Israel that the PA will be reconstituted and come back in and rule Gaza. He essentially told the girl in the, nest, in the Face the Nation interview that ain't going to happen. Before this conflict in Gaza started, they were on a path to normalize their relations with these Arab states and with Turkey. And they lost this opportunity. And right now we see more disagreement coming from the Latin America. Lula was talking about these attacks. Well, and got a bunch of Latin American leaders to join him too. It's a lot of pressure and tensions coming to Netanyahu and his administration. At the same time, you see no desire to understand the situation and continuing this, how they can put all of this together and decide to continue this conflict because they're losing on every stage, on every front. You've asked essentially the same question that is relevant, pertinent to the Ukraine situation that we talked about insanity about. But probably I should have put more force on the domestic politics issue because that is such an important issue. And for Netanyahu, it has another dimension altogether. It's not just staying in power. It's not just domestic politics associated with staying in power. It's his going to jail. And so he's got to keep this conflict going and he's got to keep it going with some real huzpa or he's done, he's finished. And I think that's motivating him more than many people might think. His own dire political situation is coloring the way he thinks his objectives have to be forcefully met in this war. And Domestic politics in any democracy plays a hell of a lot more of a role in national security decision-making, foreign policy decision-making than most people know or think. 
Certainly it does in America. So many decisions have been made based on domestic politics, not on the international situation. And I think to a certain extent, it's Netanyahu. It's doing it to him, too. But I also think it's his character. I've watched him for almost 20 years now. I think it's his character. I've watched him glory in embarrassing U.S. presidents. I've watched him glory in speaking English exquisitely enough to embarrass a U.S. president who normally doesn't show it, but it happens. I've seen him go to the Congress of the United States at the invitation of the other political party and give an address in defiance of the sitting president of the United States. I've had people tell me, I've had people tell me whose views I trust and understand are probably accurate, that Netanyahu did not like the fact that a black man was president of the United States. This is a man who at heart of hearts is a racist, a supreme racist. So all these things are playing in his decision making now. In the eyes of Netanyahu and his administration, who's going to be more beneficial, going to be a Republican candidate or a Democrat candidate when it comes to the U.S. presidential election? We don't have any choice. We do not. For the first time, I think, in my lifetime anyway, I, I kind of said that when we had McGovern. <laughs> I didn't know Jim McGovern that well after I studied him a little bit and realized I probably shouldn't have said that. But th this may be the first time that it's so stark that we do not have a choice. We simply do not have a choice. I, I had a former um, very, very powerful Republican say to me the other day in an email that he had never seen anything like this, didn't expect to see anything like this, but there wasn't a single solitary person in his knowledge that he would vote for for president of the United States in either party, independent or otherwise. And this, this is a tough core Republican, 86 years old. And been in the been in the White House before, um, uh, lawyer, uh, big law firm, not anymore, retired now, but um, still very lucid in his mind. And, and he said, "There's no one to vote for. Yeah, it, it, I, there's no reason for me to go to the polls." Netanyahu has some sort of hopes that the next president going to be more in line with him, like Donald Trump. Well, he once said, I'm told, I did not hear him say it, but I don't doubt that he probably said something like this anyway, that he controls us. Uh, he's not worried about the White House or the Congress or anything else because he controls us. He has us in his hand. Um, I think he would probably say that's easier with some presidents than others, and he would probably say it's much easier with Donald Trump. The man's so stupid, I can get anything out of him. Um, and and Donald Trump is so driven by his cult that all I got to do is figure out what his cult wants, and <laughs> you know then I got it. And his cult can, includes people like John Hagee, the Christians United for I Israel leader. Uh, who's probably done more than any other single American to finance settlements in the West Bank, because that's where a lot of his collections go, is, is there. The ones that don't go to finance his ranch, airplane, and big automobiles, they go to finance settlements in the West Bank. Um, so I, Netanyahu probably figures he can he can deal with any American president, but he'd probably prefer Trump. Yeah, After he all, he moved the embassy to Jerusalem. <laughs> I want to know what's your take on the new president of Argentina. How did you find him? I did follow, follow Buenos Aires politics pretty closely there for a while. I do watch what he says sometimes, listen to what he says sometimes, and I find him very squirrely. Um, he, he just he seems to be all over the map ideologically. He's he's got a core of ideology, but whatever whatever strikes him as is, is fanciful on one day might be different from that core. And then the next day it might be reinforcing majorly of that core. It, he just seems to be a very mercurial character. Um, I've had people that I know in Argentina who who are watching him, I guess, with, with some amusement, one of them. Um, and they've said that he won't last long. Well, you know, it's, it's always been my uh, thought uh, I've spent some time in Santiago and some time in Buenos Aires and uh, Bariloche and uh, Patagonia, northern Patagonia, and fishing and other things down there. Really love the people. The people are wonderful. They need better leaders. <laughs> That's what I've always said. But the thing that I always noted um, was in most cases, the major item that needed to be taken on and done something dramatic with was land reform. 
And in that sense, I understood why the priest I would talk to, for example, in the Catholic Church, because my wife is my former wife, former wife, my dead wife, um, she was Catholic, and uh, I knew a lot of priests and a lot of people from the church through her and with her, and they would tell me all these stories. You know, the Catholic Church down there turned into, basically turned into communists, <laughs> places like El Salvador in particular. Um, I, don't, I don't say that as a pejorative. I say that as a reaction to the what what did they call it the latifundia the 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 way they dealt with the land the way they dealt with the peasants they were almost serfs they were almost slaves and we reinforced that we el coloso del norte we reinforced it we went in and said okay you five percent who have all the money and the land we are going to work with you because you speak our language, business. And we don't care if you're corrupt. We don't care if you steal. We don't care if you are corrupt as hell. Venezuela and Colombia come to mind. I, I, I had to deal with Colombia with us giving them $750 million to fight drugs and maybe about $200 million towards drugs and the other five hundred went to pay off all the, all the corruption. So we reinforced that. Year after year after year after year, we, we put the Bolsonaros in there because we like the Bolsonaros. And we, we kicked the people out who wanted to treat the whole of the people, wanted to give them health care, wanted to give them education, wanted to give them land on a fair basis, you know, give them a future, give them a life, give them a living, give them hospitals and so forth. So I see a lot of what has happened in South America, which should have been a mirror image of what happened in North America with the United States. I remember when Argentina was going to be the United States of the South. Immigration patterns were the same, Italy, Germany, and so forth. All this flow of uh, intellect and wisdom and education and so forth was the same. Uh, it's going to happen. Argentina will be the, the, the United States of the South and Brazil will join them. It, it never happened because we helped, I think, manufacture these tyrants. We helped manufacture these dictators in some cases like Pinochet. We helped put them into power. We helped the militaries keep the people oppressed. We trained with the militaries. We educated the militaries. We brought them to the United States and trained them and sent them back, sent them back to be oppressors. Um, so we bear a lot of the burden of having contaminated your region of the world. 